Well, Eduardo came to us uh, a couple of years back talking about the early stages of, of his brain-computer interface technology. We got involved with uh, a patient who had a locked-in syndrome and was able to, in effect, kind of compose music without the ability to move or say anything. She just used her eye movement, choosing different elements of music and fusing them together. What she really was looking for was to play a duet with him. When he said, OK, you're playing the computer, now I'm going to take the piano and we're going to do a duet, you could see her eyes going, sting, that's what I want to do. When you look at some of the patients that we have here, communication internally is all intact, but they're cut out from the rest of the world by virtue of their disabilities. And I think it's really important that there is technology that overcomes these disabilities, that offers patients who have locked-in syndrome, motor neuron disease, multiple sclerosis, the ability to be creative. The brain-computer interface bridges the gap that is there because of their inability to move or talk through accessing directly what's going on in the brain through EEG technology. We have patients here who, before they had an injury or a neurodegenerative condition, they had very active music lives. Case in point, of course, is Rosie. He was a violinist, professional violinist. Here, we have a means of reconnecting with that very important part of their earlier life. You have to be sensitive here because it might be perhaps too much emotionally to reconnect with music. So it's always worth checking in with someone whether this is something they want to actively do. But if it is, Here's a great way of accessing all of that untapped creativity and bringing it to life again. As yet, it's not possible to read people's thoughts, but what we can do is we can use brainwaves to, to, to generate some control, especially when we use external stimuli. We are measuring the brain activity in the visual cortex of the brain. So each user selects one of the four options by looking at the corresponding flashing light and the system detects which one they're looking at, and this sends the choice to the musician. So there are hundreds of little phrases that are two bars long each, and I compose in a way that they can be combined in multiple combinations. One of the key things about this system is that not only does it give a user the interaction or the control of, a, of an instrument, it allows them to interact with each other. Through this technology, they can all get involved at the same time in something musical. So you've got a social element, you've got a creative element, who knows, you might even have spiritual elements, all of that sort of thing, through this technology bringing people together. It's the first ever instance I know of where a group of people work together towards a common goal using a BCI system. So it is really a, an eight-fold um, ensemble all interacting and making music together. Those patients are rarely part of a group. They may be in the group, they may be there, but they're not interacting with the group. And I think what's beautiful with this string quartet is you have four patients going to be able to interact with each other. And also being able to perform in front of friends or a small audience. When, when we talk to them, you can see them really wanting to do that. Yes, I want to perform. Yes, I want to show what I'm capable of. And I think that's, that's exactly what you want. You want to engage those patients because they are there. What really surprised us was the, uh, the level of engagement of the four patients. All of them, without exception, were really willing to participate, to contribute, 
No, because it could it could go completely the other way. We could have struggled to get them to you know, to understand, to participate, but it was so easy. You know, we did not need to spend a lot of time practicing or trying it. They came in, put the thing on, and got on with it. And that was a wonderful surprise for us. We are not using it yet, but there is a phenomenon that the more you look at that particular flashing pattern, the higher the signal becomes in the individual cortex. So you could select a phrase of music and perhaps use the, um, the continuous control to tell the musicians how loud it should be played, for example. So in addition to a switch, effectively we have a potentiometer which you can turn the power up and down. If this whole idea was developed, it could have ramifications in all areas of someone's life. Potentially I can see um, the ability for someone to express musically how they're feeling, but again without their ability to move their fingers, to communicate with words and so on. If they were able to produce music, to compose music that reflect their state of mind, that may be an amazing way for them to be able to express themselves. A music therapist can then use that to work with the patient. I like music and I am very interested in the brain-computer interface. It's more interactive with people actually getting my instructions. It was great to hear the musician play the phrase I selected. Yes, I tried to select music that was harmonious with the others. It's very cool. really, really enjoyed it. Considering Richard has um, already composed some of his own pieces of music, which on the whole have been interesting. Um, <laughs> this one's been a little bit more, more um, mainstream, shall we say. A bit more professional. Um, absolutely. Um, no, absolutely beautiful. Really, really lovely. I think probably some competition. Yes. Yes, I'd say some competition between them, really. You think Rosie was the biggest competition? So it was a battle against you and Rosie. Richard had already decided that he was the best. He's, he's very modest.